Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Murder and One to Go. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Stange is my stock and trade. If life's giving you so much punishment, you're buckling at the knees, you need my help. George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, do you remember Carol Gordon? Once she was as glamorous and famous as any movie star you can name today. Then some 18 years ago, when talkies came in, she faded out of the limelight. Dead, perhaps. But if she isn't, I must find her. The only clue I have is that someone thinks he saw Carol Gordon about a year ago, down on Skid Row. The enclosed check is a return. retainer. And if you succeed in finding her, there will be a substantial bonus. Sincerely yours, Henry Crichton. Uh, Henry Crichton. Business management and artist representation. Carol Gordon? Uh Uh-uh, careful. Don't say you remember her, Brooksy. You'll give your age away. Well, I don't remember. Two world-shaking events took place in the 20s. The stock market crash and Carol Gordon. Her autograph always gets you two of Wallace Reed in the trade. And now Skid Row. Well, maybe this Mr. Crichton knows of a small part for her. Well, if he's gambling with $250 just to play Good Samaritan, I'd like to shake hands with that gentleman. And if he isn't, it might be a good idea to find out what's on his mind. Mmm. Pretty swank. Ah. Courier and Ives prints right out in the hall. The Dorset building. The agent's paradise. The house, the 10% book. George! Hey, I think that's coming from our client's office, Brooksy. Oh. He's dead! He's dead! In there! Oh, oh so horrible. All right now, sister. All right, take it easy. Get hold of yourself. What? Try to calm down. Who's dead? Mr. Crichton. I just came back from lunch. I found him lying there on the floor. The fire poker next to it. His head is... Would you please call the police? Valentine, I know you were put on this earth to keep me from being bored, to see that I don't fall into a rut. But uh, please, let's keep this murder nice and simple. But take another look at this letter, will you, Lieutenant? You must admit Crichton might have been killed because he was determined to find Carol Gordon. Miss Brooks, I used to be a Carol Gordon fan. Why, it got so Mrs. Riley wouldn't let me go to the movies when her pictures were playing. Why, Lieutenant? But nobody's even thought of that woman in years and years. Crichton dead, Lieutenant. Well, being just a plodding, unimaginative copper, I'm going to have to stick to facts. Namely, Crichton got his head bashed in with a poker from which all the fingerprints were carefully wiped off. Well, that's quite a fact to be stuck with. There was a struggle and the plug of the electric clock on the desk was pulled out of the wall. Now, that sets the time of the murder at 12.35. And a half a dozen people saw Miss Jackson, Crichton's secretary, in the coffee shop all through the lunch hour. A lieutenant, I understand Crichton had quite an imposing list of clients. Yes, sir, and I'm going to talk to every one of them. No flights are fancy for me, pal. Uh, oh, incidentally, Valentine. Yeah? Uh, how are you going to go about tracing uh, Carol Gordon? Obviously, she doesn't want to be found. And she probably doesn't look anything like she used to. And Skid Row is a pretty big place, you know. George, I think the lieutenant is trying to imply that it's going to be like looking for a needle in a haystack. Well, what's so hard about finding a needle in a haystack? Well, huh? that's what I... What? All you do is get a magnet. The needle comes to you. Now, look, Mr. Cabranian, what'll it cost me to have you run this picture in your movie house tomorrow afternoon? You mean you're going to pay me, fella? What's wrong with it, fella? Oh, nothing's wrong with it, Mr. Cabranian. It was a super colossal production back there in 1928. Yeah, Romance in April, starring Carol Gordon. Never heard that one, fella. You? In the movie business and never heard of it? In 1928, I was running the coffee pot. I wish I was still running it. Well, anyway, you wouldn't mind showing this picture for uh, 
Fifty dollars, would you? There's just one thing we ought to tell you, Mr. Yeah, I knew this was coming, fella. Uh, there's no sound, no music in this picture. It's, uh, it's silent. Well, something new, huh? You don't think for a moment I'd talk you into anything that would damage the reputation of Gabrenian's cameo theater, the gem of Skid Row. Are you kidding? I don't even advertise a picture we're playing. I just hang out a sign, soft seats, open all night, 15 cents. <laughs> then this ought to be right down your alley. The slumber of your selected clientele won't be disturbed by any noises coming off the screen. Just a little piano music for mood. Yeah, lady, you might got something there. This is a gal who knows all the angles. Yeah. On her, they look good, too. Too bad the cameo ain't barbecue house like it used to be. You're a real nice filly, lady. Why, thank you, Mr. Gabrenian. I don't know whether to blush or whinny. Huh? What's that? Uh, <clears throat> now, what about it? Does romance in April play here tomorrow? It plays. Money in advance, fella. No objection to me selling the tickets? You sell, but remember the tickets are numbered. I'll know just how many people go in. Oh, you're a trusting soul, Mr. Gabrenny. <laughs> you said it. Yes, sir. Here's your ticket, sir. Go right in. Oh, thank you. Well, business is pretty slow, darling. Uh-huh. Well, you can't say Mr. Gabrenian didn't advertise the revival of romance in April. Yeah, with the late Mr. Crichton's money. So far, your magnets attracted nothing but the usual Skid Row characters. Maybe the whole oh, thing... Oh, wait a minute. Hold it, Brooksy. Can you tell me if the features started yet? In just a few minutes, sir. Good. One, please. Thank you. George, didn't you recognize yeah, Brooksy, yeah. We're beginning to draw a better class of people. Anthony Chapman, the movie heartthrob. Now, what would he be doing in a place like this? And trying to look inconspicuous. An interesting question, Angel. I bet the answer's even more interesting. I called up before, young man. I understand romance in April goes on at 2.15. Is that correct? Yeah. You've got two minutes to make it. Just like to be sure, time is money. At 15 cents? Is that correct? And I understand the picture runs an hour and 12 minutes. Yeah, that's correct. Someone else out, Sonny. <laughs> a little man in a big briefcase. Brooksy, what's your guess? Vice president of a bank? A successful insurance salesman? Or just a lover of the silent cinema? Uh, you know, I got a definite feeling we started something here. What? Hey! Oh. Look what we've got now, George. The carriage trade drawing up. Now I'm sure we ought to change prices before six. You can call for me in about an hour, Ralph. Yes, ma'am. One seat in the loge, please. Loge? I uh, doubt if we can build you one at a moment's notice. What? Oh, well, whatever you've got. Thanks. Thank you. Hmm. I'd say that was about $5,000 worth of mink on the hoof. Hey, look, a Brennan actually opened the door for it. I don't blame the man for being overwhelmed. Looks like all kinds of people don't mind coming to this popcorn cove to see romance in April. Uh, one ticket, please. It's 15 cents, isn't it? Yeah, and you're just in time for the picture. See, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Hope you don't mind the pennies. That's all I have. Oh, they add up just the same. They are. I hope you enjoy the picture. Yeah, I'm sure I will. I take it you're a Carol Gordon fan. Yeah, and her severest critic. Did you hear that, Brooksy? That's an angel, I think. Carol Gordon? Oh, that couldn't be, George. Well, I could be wrong. But there was something about her eyes. But she seemed so old and pathetic. Come on, Brooksy. Capranian can take over the box office now. We're going inside and make sure. must have broken Gabrenian's heart to hire a piano player for the day. That girl on the screen, Angel. Look at it carefully. Don't you see some resemblance between her and the woman we saw before us at the box office? Mm, sorry, George. I can't talk myself into it. Mm, yeah. Maybe I am punching a little too hard. Oh, she was beautiful, wasn't she? Even in that costume with a waistline down to her knees. And not a bad actress to compete with these titles. 
Ellen looked at the faded flowers and thought of the waste of her own life. <laughs> oh, brother. No! No! Oh, no! Oh, waste of life! My life! What did I do? <laughs> it was Carol Gordon. What happened? Come on, stick with me, Brooksy. Get out of here. Her room is right down the hall here, folks. Yeah, see, Brooksy? I told you she didn't just vanish. We were about giving up hope, mister. We've been over this block with a fine-tooth comb for the last hour. Hmm. can imagine the places you've been in, miss. Now, this here hotel don't rightly belong down in this neighborhood. Why do you know we change bed sheets and towels twice a week? Yeah, well, bully for you, but what, what did you say was the name she was using? Uh, Ethel Mills. That is, if it's the woman you've been describing... And you know, funny thing. What's that? Huh? Well, about 20 minutes ago, while I was away from the desk, somebody left a bottle of champagne for her. Champagne? Yep, yep. All wrapped up fancy, too. Brought it right up to her. No other hotel around here gives room service like we do. Well, uh, here it is. Hmm. She's in there all right. I think I know what happened. What do you mean? Well, if Ethel has a bottle around, it don't last long. Well, something might have happened to her in her frame of mind. Yeah, we better take a look, friend. Yeah, that's right, young fella. Don't want anything bad happening to the reputation of the hotel. Uh oh. Mm, I'd like a light. Well, don't just stand there. Where are those towels you're so proud of? Mm, all right, over there. Hey, uh, oh. Come on. Try to sit up. I. I can't, and they're hurting. Mm. Usually she don't oh. feel like that until the next day. Oh. And the bottle's only half empty. Seems somebody left a card with it, too. Let me see oh. that. To Carol Gordon. Oh. On the day of her triumphant return to the screen. Oh. Wait, this wet towel ought to help her. No time for that, Brooksy. We have to get her to a hospital. But, George, she's only... Only been poisoned. Oh. One sniff of this bottle will tell you that. Oh. Poison? Somebody else followed her here from the cameo. Somebody who wants to see Carol Gordon dead. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about winter driving. If you find the January days are kind of chilly, don't forget, cold weather is rough on your car, too. It may mean a lot of grinding starting wear, an extra drain on your car's battery. But a sure way to get fast starts, to keep your battery from working overtime, and to keep operating costs down, is to use Chevron Supreme gasoline. For well, this high-octane motor fuel has special blending agents that give fast starts and speedy warm-up every time you use the starter. Besides lending a helping hand to your battery, Chevron Supreme gives fast pickup in traffic, smooth acceleration, and the extra power that makes your car great on hills. It's a premium quality gasoline, and it's climate-tailored for each different altitude and temperature zone in the West. That means you can depend on it the year-round for fast starts, and smoother, extra power wherever you motor. Get a tank full of Chevron Supreme gasoline tomorrow. Get it at standard stations and at independent Chevron gas stations, where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Someone hires you to trace down an old movie star named Carol Gordon. Even before you can get started, your client is found murdered. You pick up from there and finally locate the once famous beauty in a cheap Skid Row hotel. The payoff there is that someone's tried to kill her, too. If you're like George Valentine, you won't rest till you find out why murder is singing such a merry song of mayhem. Valentine, I don't care where you've got Carol Gordon. Get her down here to headquarters. Well, you can't blame the lieutenant for hiding her out when she left the hospital. Somebody's out to get her. Now, look, chum boy, I'm not too sure the lady didn't try to poison herself. Yes, yeah, so you've been saying, with bullheaded regularity. Well, you forget the elevator boy in Crichton's building. He recognized Carol Gordon's picture, put her right on the seat of the crime. Now, guilty conscience. I want to talk to her. Uh-huh. Maybe you got an answer for those three strangely out-of-place characters who showed up at the revival of Romance in April. Oh, Tony Chapman and Miss Ferris are both movie people. Maybe 
Maybe morbid curiosity brought him down there. Who knows? Uh-uh, Riley. It seems a little more than coincidence that just when Crichton hired me to find Miss Gordon, those two should decide to take in one of her pictures at the cameo. Well, Also, uh... both Chapman and Miss Ferris were managed by Crichton. And what makes it even more screwier, they just became engaged to each other. And yet they show up at their theater at different times. I don't care how it sounds. Chapman has an alibi for the time of Crichton's murder. The attendant in the garage of his department house vouches for the time. As for Miss Ferris, well, as far as she's concerned, she has no motive. And the mousy little man who showed up at the revival. The one with a briefcase under his arm. I told you I saw him hanging around the hospital, too. <sighs> okay, okay. If and when we find this little gnome, I'll talk to him. In the meantime, you get Carol Gordon down here and fast. Here you are, Miss Gordon. My car is parked right over here. There's, there's really nothing I can tell the lieutenant, Mr. Valentine. Well, you just tell him the truth, Carol. And if he growls at you a little, don't let him upset you. Okay, here we are. The three of us can fit into the front seat. Oh, I, I know my story sounds a little weak, but I did drop in to see Henry Crichton on a personal matter. Once we were good friends. When I found him like that, I didn't stop to think. I hurried down the stairs and out of the building. Yes, yeah, sure, I understand. I don't know if I can turn around here on the hill. I think it's the quickest way back to headquarters. What's the matter? Oh. Hey, George! We're rolling down the hill. Somebody's been monkeying around with the brakes. They won't hold. Oh, try to keep it straightened out, George. We're going faster! We're going up on the sidewalk! Hang on, Hang on. I'm going to crash. Oh. Oh. It's too close for comfort. Oh. Everybody all right? Oh. What about you, Miss Gordon? I'm just shaken up. Good thing I picked out a wooden fence. What happened? It looks like somebody tried to get all three of us this time. Yes, doesn't it? Oh, oh, wait a minute. What? What's the matter? You see that Miss Gordon gets to headquarters. I just spotted someone I want to talk to. Okay, George. Hey, let me through here, will you? One side, please. Hey, you, come back here. A few questions I want to ask you. Let go of me, please. I don't know anything. There's nothing I can tell you. Now, look, Buster, I've been dreaming about you in that briefcase. What makes you pop up all over the place? Well, I, I've been following you just to see that Miss Gordon was all right, that nothing happened to her. Come on, come on. Who are you? The name is Moody, sir. Walter Moody, you see? Here, here's my card. Walter Moody, 6th Street Grammar School, principal. I don't get it, friend. I am the oldest and the most faithful member of the Carol Gordon fan club. I venture to say the only member after all these years. Are you kidding? Oh, she was a fine actress. I have a great big shelf just full of scrapbooks. Her pictures, almost every line that was ever written about Miss Gordon. Hey, you know, this is just cockeyed enough to turn out to be useful. I beg your pardon. Would you help Miss Gordon if she were in real trouble? Oh, I'd do anything, sir. Anything. Okay, Mr. Moody. Let's begin by taking a look at that five-foot shelf of yours. <laughs> You mean Carol actually used to correspond with you, Mr. Moody? Oh, yes. <laughs> My, personally. I used to send the information in a newsletter to fans all over the country. Hmm. Uh -huh. This must have been a big event in their life, according to this communique. My dearest number one fan, something has happened here today in this beautiful little town that's made me the happiest girl in the world. Soon, I hope to be able to tell you all about it. I've always been curious about that, Mr. Valentine. What did she mean? Hmm. Eudora, California, December 9th, 1929. You know, Mr. Moody, I may be able to satisfy your curiosity. <laughs> Nineteen twenty-nine, December. Yep, I write here in my records. December 9th. Ethel Mills and Anthony Switzer. You can remember them two very well. When the first couples are married, it's just as the peace. Anthony Switzer could be Tony Chapman. Why not? Huh? Look here, son. What's all the shooting about, anyway? Mm, what do you mean, Pops? Well, just last week, a fellow was here. Named Crichton. It's with a young lady. <laughs> Long, blonde hair. He wants the same information. I think you've really given me something to wedge with, Pops. Thanks a lot. Mm-hmm. 
Naturally, I can't deny it, Valentine. It's a matter of record. Maybe you didn't deny it, Chapman, but you certainly have done everything to keep your marriage to Carol Gordon a secret. Don't make me out a heel, will you? When talking pictures came in, Carol simply disappeared. After a while, I thought she was dead. You know, it would be a terrible shock to your fans, Chapman, to find out that you let your wife simply disappear when she may have needed you. Don't I know that? And now engaged to beautiful and blonde Miss Ferris. No one can say I haven't tried to find my wife. When I heard about one of her pictures being shown, I even went to the theater thinking she might turn up. Uh Uh-huh. And when she did, did you follow her and leave a bottle of champagne so she could celebrate her triumphant return to the screen? What? I don't know what you're talking about. I lost her in the crowd after she ran out. You know, Chapman, you'd fit in nicely as the murderer of Crichton if you didn't have such a perfect alibi. I've been through all that with the police. The attendant downstairs in the garage told me to drive in at 12.30. Yeah, I know, I know. You told him you weren't locking the car. Which I always do, but I'd lost my key. Still haven't got around to getting one, as a matter of fact. Okay, Chapman, okay. I'm just checking. Anyway, now I can work out something with Carol. Get a quiet divorce. Maybe... Tony, I've been waiting hours for you down in the lobby. What in the world uh, are you Oh, gaining? Valentine, I'd like you to meet Arlene Ferris, my fiancée. Tell me, Miss Ferris, do you make it a practice to become engaged to men you know are married? What? Why did you have to do that, Valentine? Arlene didn't know, and there's really no reason why she should. The whole thing might have been smoothed over. But you did know about Carol Gordon, didn't you, Arlene? You must be out of your mind. You and Henry Crichton paid a little visit to Eudora shortly before he was murdered. Arlene... Now, what was the deal? Were the two of you going to shake Chapman down after I located Carol? This isn't true, is it, Arlene? Why should I deny it? Seemed a very good idea at the time. Good Lord. Do you think I was infatuated with your worn-out boyish charm, your toupee, what? the caps on your teeth? Shut up, you... Who do you well, think you are? Well, if you two are going to have an emotional wing-ding, you probably want a little privacy. Good day. Hey, Lieutenant. We can use this office in back of the garage. Go on in, Miss Gordon. Tell me, Valentine, why a garage? Why didn't you call up and ask me to meet you in a Turkish bath? Oh, oh, oh please, Lieutenant, the lady. Ah. Now, what's this all about? Well, I didn't think you'd have any objections to Miss Gordon making a phone call. Oh, for the love of Mike, why couldn't she have done it from my office? It wouldn't have worked that way. Oh, I, I don't know if I can say the things you told me, Mr. Valentine. I hate Tony. Hated him ever since he didn't lift a finger to help me. When he knew I was desperate. But just do your best, Carol. As an actress, your best is better than you think. I'm sure of it. Okay, here's his number. I'll dial it for you. Well. Hey, I'm... Oh, all right. Hello. Tony? This is Carol. Yes, I know this must be a shock to you. But listen, dear, let me do the talking. Tony, I've been unfair to you all these years. I should have come back and let you have the divorce. It must have been dreadful for you. Couldn't we do that now, quietly, so that no one need ever know? Then you'll be free. Yes. Uh, Meet me in five minutes on the corner of State and McGovern. Please hurry. Goodbye. Oh, you were wonderful. That ought to get Mr. Chapman down here in the garage with the speed of light. Light? (laughs) Why don't you try shedding some once in a while, Valentine? There shall be light, Lieutenant, I hope. Now, you ladies stay here in the office. Come on, Riley. Here's Chapman's custom job over here. Well, what do I do? Just stand here and admire it? What the... Come on back here, Lieutenant. We want to see this act without being seen. How, why'd you do that? Just a pious hope. And if I'm wrong, I'll... Wait a minute. There's Chapman. Get back in his car. That fool attendant must have locked it anyway. Well... Having trouble, Buster? I'll take those keys. This one in particular. The one you said you'd lost. Your fancy alibi. Let go of this. Remember your manners, Chapman. Let Chumboy have the key. 
Uh, what is this? A frame-up? Oh, famous last words. Ah, that's the trouble with elaborate alibis. People are so forgetful. Or to say it another way, friend, you just put the finger on yourself. George Valentine will be back in just a moment to explain his reasons for naming Chapman as the killer. Meanwhile, quite a few folks have the impression that the only values an artist knows are color values. But not so with artist Ren Wicks of Beverly Hills, California. When it comes to economy and car operation, Mr. Wicks knows the value of RPM motor oil. Here's Mr. Wicks' statement, quote, It takes a lot of things to keep a car running. One thing is good motor oil. That's why I selected RPM years ago. It reduces wear, cuts repair bills, unquote. RPM motor oil will save wear in your car, too. will bring a new economy to your car operation. For this premium quality motor oil was developed precisely for modern high-speed engines. Chemical compounds in RPM keep your entire engine cleaner. They protect those finely polished, close-fitting parts. Protect them from corrosion, gum, lacquer, and carbon. If your car is about due for a drain and refill, give it a new lease on life by getting RPM motor oil. Remember, it's better for your car and for your pocketbook. Get RPM at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. How did George Valentine come to suspect Chapman? Right at the moment, that's a question that's also troubling Lieutenant Riley. Valentine, if I played hunches like you do, I'd be laughed out of the department. I have to stick to facts. Well, that's the advantage I have, Lieutenant. When a hunch doesn't pay off, there's only Angel here to do the laughing. Oh, I only snicker. How long are you two going to talk shop? For instance, the one hunch about running Carol Gordon's picture brought a lot of other things to the surface. Chapman must have come down to the cameo all ready to follow Carol if she showed up. He and his lethal champagne. Yeah, he also made a scooter out of my car. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, quite a mechanic. Old lover boy even knew how to stop the clock in Crichton's office at the right time to make his alibi stick. George, I still don't know why you hunched Arlene out of the picture. Oh, she had too good a deal with Crichton, blackmailing Chapman to spoil it. Everything would have turned out as planned if Chapman hadn't found out what his business manager was cooking up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, don't be so depressed, Lieutenant. I'll try to teach George a healthier respect for facts. (laughs) <laughs> you shouldn't be bothering your lovely head with facts, Angel. Not with your corner on the market when it comes to figures. Why, darling. Oh, just stating a fact, sweetheart. Oh, you can say the sweetest things, dearest. <laughs> well, I've got a great big hunch my stomach can't stand much more of this, so goodbye, kids. <laughs> Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Brooksy. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Jeanette Nolan as Carol Gordon, John McIntyre as Chapman, Virginia Gregg as Arlene, Howard McNear as Moody, Louis Van Ruten as Gabrenian, and Dick Ryan as the manager. The music is composed and presented by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>